of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Harry Potter Sunday. I must admit, like maybe some of you, it's been a while since I thought about Harry Potter. I needed to reach high on the shelf to find the first fantasy novel released the 26th of June, 1997. Harry Potter, if you recall, Harry Potter and the Philosopher, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Seven books since then, and a final volume in 2007. For me, once I found it, the memories came in a flood. My daughter was preparing for college. My late husband, Bruce, was intrigued with Harry Potter. So he bought the book. Daughter Alice was intrigued too. So every night as I cooked the supper, I could hear them, heads together, reading to each other about Harry Potter, that lonely little orphan boy, boy wizard, played by Daniel Radcliffe. Now, of course, we know, much older and very successful, but not too old <clears throat> to stand on the picket line with Aftra. Harry set out to confront the challenges set before him. And he found companions. He found a community in faithful friends at Hogwarts. In the beginning, as probably many of you know, there was great worry in Christian quarters, and maybe for some today, about cultic type references. And some people thought that the book was advocating witchcraft. Today, the criticism is about heteronormativity. But in the intervening years, over the course of seven books, many Christian writers claim that they have followed Harry and the author, J.K. Rowling, as they are being transformed. Harry comes to understand the power of sacrificial love over the love of power. These writers point out that even 1 Corinthians is quoted in Book 7. God chose the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised to accomplish God's purposes. Now this is sounding more like us. But we would take it further, that God so loved the world that God sent his son to live and die for us, that we might gain salvation. And you know, if you take a look at Hogwarts, it's not a high flutin' club for the rise and strong. But under Dumbledore's leadership, it's a refuge for misfits of all kinds who are not appreciated elsewhere. Hogwarts, at its best, resembles, these writers think, how Christ builds Christ Church. Not with the world's best and brightest, but the counterintuitive way of Christ. Now those of you who've been around for a long time know that our own Trudy Artisan, our Christian formation teacher for children, built a whole vacation Bible school curriculum around Hogwarts. And I suspect 
that she emphasized the points I've just made and others. Long way around to our scriptures today, St. Paul and Jesus, as reported in Matthew's Gospel, what are they doing? But using their spiritual and their literary and their dialogic storytelling gifts to speak to us. Just as they spoke to the emerging community of Judeo-Christians and Christian in Rome, and just as Jesus sat comfortably beside the Sea of Galilee to speak to a gathering crowd. Paul writing about 25 years after Jesus' resurrection and Matthew's gospel, about 70 in the common era. Of course, we don't know when exactly each parable was spoken. But suffice it to say that Matthew is wanting us to understand what God's reign is like in the already, that's us now, and in the not yet. And he chooses the most compelling images of his time to make his point. I can only choose two, and I chose my favorites, the mustard seed and the yeast, told to the crowd and the disciples. Just an aside, as we learned last week in the parable of the weeds and the wheat, it is not our job to make judgments about where God works and through whom. This week, we understand it will also be God's work at the end of the age. But also, this week, we understand something else. We're assured that God's work is always underway, always, right now, this minute. The world is being remade by God's hand, even when it's hidden, and even when it doesn't appear to be so. Matthew reports Jesus in these images. Matthew talking about the mustard seed. And I learned at the five o'clock mass yesterday that our own Bob Nelson has a mustard tree in his home. Have that. Right. Mustard seed grows to be 12 feet tall. And you had to have a tree trimmer come and cut it down, is that right? Yes. That's right. And for those of you who study Matthew all along, know that Matthew loves to make references to the First Testament, some people call the Old Testament. And he does so in Ezekiel 31.6. All the birds of the air nested in its branches. All the beasts of the field gave birth. And all nations lived under its shade. And in Daniel, its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it was fruit for all beasts. They shadowed under it, and the fowls of heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. So the mustard tree, grown from a tiny seed. Let those who have ears to hear listen, and the Holy Spirit helps us with us, helps us hear. And yeast in the next parable, this is really my very favorite, of a woman baking bread as the image of the reigning presence of God. She hid the yeast in three measures of flour, which is enough, I'm told, to bake 40 or more substantial loaves of bread. Yeast, after all, is a multiplying cell. It's hidden, it's unseen, but it's a source of major transformation. Change is coming in the world. And we 
faithful people can trust that. Now, I remember being um, sort of, um, I don't know what I would say, but I just had a point to make with my dean at seminary. So I marched in and I said, Dean Turner, nothing is happening here, nothing. I do not see justice being done. I don't see the arc of justice that Martin Luther King talks about happening. And my dean, who uh, had a wonderful Southern accent, said, he said, well, Susan, this was 1992. He says, well, Susan, what about apartheid? It's just collapsed. And indeed, Winnie and Nelson are on their way to the United States to make a tour about freedom and reconciliation. Well, I couldn't disagree with that. That was something that many people, not just Nelson Mandela, but many, many others had been working toward for years. They had been doing it one small act at a time. One tiny, tiny little act. Lots and lots of people. And eventually, there was a change with God's help. So Paul writes to a collective community, a whole community, not just about individuals. Some people read Paul as a message to individuals, but really he's talking to faithful followers in Rome. And their intention, their intention because Nero has just invited Jews who've been expelled back again. Many of them are Jewish Christians. And in the meantime, while they were gone, Gentile Christians had been building up households and following Jesus. So there was a little tension there, a little tension. But Paul wanted reconciliation for all. He wanted them all to live together. They were under all kinds of stress. And Paul talks about it, persecution, famine, poverty, war. But Paul was hoping in his unshakable faith in God as seen in Jesus that there would be reconciliation. There would be reconciliation. And all would work together with God's help for good. He wanted to say that God was supporting us in a cloud of love, always and everywhere. Remember that old hymn? God is working God's purposes out. God is working God's purposes out. God's here in the world. God's reign, even when it doesn't appear to be so, even when it's small, so, so small, that we can't see it. We know that we're not alone. We listen to the Spirit. We love God with all our heart and mind and soul. And we, each one of us, put our gifts, well, however tiny they are, however tiny they are, in God's service. And we try to look like Jesus. Yeah, the end of apartheid came. It came through the tiny, tiny acts of many people. And right now, I think, I mean, I have to say this, many people are frustrated. They don't know what to do because like the groups in Rome, we're so divided. We're so divided, and it's painful. It's really painful for us. It's painful. I mean, I don't know what to do either, but I think maybe if I think of one small thing, one or two, and maybe if you do, and maybe if others do, and maybe if all our gifts come together, there will be reconciliation, I don't know. I know this, 
Yeah, I learned something very important from one of my parishioners at St. Luke's in North Park. As you know, it's a parish for the Sudanese, it has been, and now for many other people from other places in Africa. And I asked this big, strong, professional man who'd come from Sudan. I, I truly wondered, because I know what the situation is, was and still is. And I said, how did you get here? How did you get here? And he said, I depended upon God in Jesus alone. I depended upon God in Jesus alone. Amen.